Today on Zola Levitt Presents. And so, in a parallel way, the Jewish people are looking for Yemot HaMashiach, the day of Messiah. Isn't it amazing? These parallel yearnings of the Christian believers and the Jewish people looking for the day of Messiah. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. Zion forever. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we want to welcome you to our series, Zion Forever. You know, we're talking about the City of David and the Temple Mount. The most contested real estate on the planet, I would say, and not without cause, because Jerusalem, from God's point of view, is the center of the earth. Yeah, it's the center of the center because God chose it to be the apple of His eye. You know, Israel is only 8,000 square miles I mean, you can drive from east to west in about an hour and 45 minutes, Correct. from north to south in about eight hours, mm -hmm. roughly. And the surrounding nations surrounding, they have what, five million miles? Five million square miles, the Muslim world. And we need you to know that that does not mean just the Arab world. Many Arabs are Muslims, but not all Muslims are Arabs. They're also made up of the Iranians who are Persian, the Turks who are Turkish, and even into Africa, the Sudanese and the Somalians, they are from, the, they, are, they have received and taken the Muslim religion mm -hmm. ideology, mm -hmm. but they are not Arab. So we're talking about a huge number of people and a tremendous amount of land surrounding mm -hmm. this little place. Yeah, and I always like to go back to Psalm 2. Why did the heathen rage or the kings uh, devise mischief in a law to try to bring down God's anointed or bring down Israel? Mm. Um, but God sits in the heavens and laughs. Mm. And as his believers, we need to be that strong in our faith and not waver that God is in control. You know, we're really seeing the beginning of the time when the nations are pointing against Jerusalem. They're tilting towards Jerusalem. And Zechariah speaks very strongly about that, uh, the stumbling block that Jerusalem Jerusalem becomes. And really, Joel tells us in Joel 3 that we will be seeing a valley of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat, Emek Jehoshaphat, which is really the Kidron Valley. And so our first segment will be speaking to you from the Kidron Valley. So let's go there now. King David established Jerusalem 3,000 years ago. He made it the capital of the Jewish people. No other people, no other nation in the world has made it their capital. No monarchs, no Muslims, no Turks, no one, Miles. It's really true. You know, it's been said that Israel is 85 miles wide, but 50 centuries deep. And we're really seeing that. Standing here, we recognize that it's like the uh, archaeological tells throughout the nation, the archaeological sites. They're layered one on top of another, one culture on another. Think about this. This area was held 3,000 years ago by the Canaanites, in particular the Jebusites. At 1,000 BC, that's 3,000 years ago, King David took it over and made it the capital of Israel. Then in 586, the Babylonians came and took the Jews into captivity. At 538 BC, the Persians came, conquered the Babylonians and took over and they lasted here until 332 when Alexander the Great came with the Greeks. In fact, there's a great story about Alexander the Great coming into Jerusalem and laying prostrate before Shimon Sadiq, yeah. the high priest at the time. Right. And the Greeks were, they were scandalized that their 
emperor would lay face down before the high priest of Israel. But you know why? Because he had seen him in a dream. That's right. Several times before a battle, a decisive battle, Alexander the Great saw the picture, the picture of the high priest of Israel right. in his dreams. And so he laid prostrate before him, a phenomenon of history. Right. And the Greeks were here until 63 BC when the Romans took over. The Romans were in charge here until 70 AD. They destroyed Jerusalem as Yeshua predicted that they would. And then the, in 324 AD, Constantine came and made it a so-called Christian nation. He made the Roman Empire a Christian empire uh, in name only. And that lasted until 638 when the Muslims came up from Baghdad through Jordan and into Israel. And they ruled here until the Crusaders came uh, slashing and dashing in 1099. A tremendous slaughter between the Crusaders and the Muslims. Many Jewish people were killed as well. And the Crusaders were here until 1266 AD when the Mamluks, the Muslims from Cairo, came up and took over here for a short time. They ruled here until the Ottomans came in 1517, the Ottoman Turks, and they were here until the British with the Light Horsemen of Australia marched into Jerusalem in 1917, World War I, and began the British Mandate, in which they divided up the Middle East according to their own lights and gave a small section to Israel, which became a state in 1948. And in 1948, the prophetic clock started ticking. And we're looking forward from the Ezekiel 36, 37, arising from the graves and coming into the land to the season we're in now, when God is sprinkling clean water on his people and calling us back to himself. And we're looking forward to the book of Revelation. Absolutely, you know, the book of Revelations in 20, it says that the Lord himself shall return and conquer Jerusalem. The King of glory, the one and only Jesus, our Messiah, will return to this place this homicom and he will establish his kingdom rule for a thousand years and you if you are a believer will be with him we want to invite you say yes to yeshua and meet us here for the millennial kingdom your financial contributions to zola levitt ministries enable us to bring you our weekly television series our monthly newsletter and our website but you may not know that your gift of funds also makes a difference in Israel through our support of the Jerusalem Archaeology Fund, Bridges for Peace, and the Lone Soldier Fund. We welcome your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries as we serve together until the Messiah returns. Further up Mount Moriah, I met with Dr. Shimon Gibson, an expert on the Second Temple period. He is the author of The Final Days of Jesus, The Archaeological Evidence. Shimon, you've been writing about this famous area since the early 90s. Uh, tell us a little bit about the discoveries and the history, the research that you've done here. Well, since the beginning of the 20th century, archaeologists haven't been permitted to research the underground subterranean parts of the Temple Mount. So we have to uh, base ourselves on archival materials. And I was given the opportunity of looking at all of the, the cisterns, uh, channels, and, and uh, tunnels which exist beneath the Temple Mount uh, in an archive in, in London. And as a result, I wrote a book with a colleague of mine, David Jacobson. And it really is, it's, it's a warren of subterranean spaces. And all of these uh, areas uh, tell us a story about how uh, the Temple Mount developed all the way from uh, the biblical uh, period, but especially for that time which existed um, in the first century, the time of Jesus. And here we are at uh, the Golden Gate. This is on the, the east side of uh, the Temple Mount. And it's here, according to uh, Jewish and Christian uh, belief, the Messiah will return. Exactly so. Now there's a, a Muslim cemetery here which allegedly precludes the Messiah, Mashiach, coming through here but I think that he can probably take care of that. And you've written about the Via Dolorosa and the uh, challenges basically to that pathway to the crucifixion and tell us about that as well. Um, I, I decided at some point uh, to uh, write a book called The Final Days of Jesus, Archaeology as Evidence, 
concentrating on all the archaeological facts that we know about Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, and also in terms of the movement of Jesus within the, the city and outside as well. And uh, piecing it all together, uh, uh, it's quite amazing the, 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 the results which have come out of that. And one of them is that uh, as a result of uh, the Crusaders, um, hard uh, way of dealing with the inhabitants of Jerusalem when they conquered Jerusalem in 1099, they simply killed everyone in sight, whether or not they were Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, local right. Christian. And as a result, the whole tradition of the Via della Rosa, from the place of the trial to the place of the crucifixion, was shifted from one side of the city to the other. Wow. So what is your belief about the actual findings, what you saw there, and where the pathway would really be? Well, the trial can now be placed uh, in the, the old palace of Herod the Great, yes. which is situated on the west side of uh, the city. And 99% of all scholars all over the world would agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the Via Dolorosa, the path that was taken when Jesus was taken by the, the Roman soldiers from Pontius Pilate uh, to the place of crucifixion, would have led from the west side of the city towards the north through the city to the Gennet Gate, he was then led outside to Golgotha, which is now beneath the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And indeed, uh, together with another colleague of mine, Joan Taylor, I wrote a book about the, the archaeology of the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And what's interesting is that there used to be an enormous cavity there, a quarry. So Golgotha wasn't really um, uh, uh, consisting of crosses which are on top of a, of a, of a knoll, uh, a kind of little hillock but actually was within a basin-like area uh, which had been quarried out for stone in antiquity. So it was very much a public display, not a hill far away as we hear in the hymns. Yes, I mean, you would, you would uh, be passing along the road which would come out of the city and you could then see on your right as you came out of the city, mm -hmm. um, you would see this large quarry area with tombs which had been cut into the scarps, little gardens below because um, the water would have come down from the, the large pool which was there. Hence we hear in the Gospel of John regarding the, the garden which was in the area uh, close to the, the, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea where Jesus was brought for burial. Mm -hmm. And so regarding the current availability of uh, artifacts from these sites, uh, how do you, I know there's a temple sifting project and there are people that are, are trying to find things that are here, but it's really limited, isn't it, as to what you can, what you can do? As an archaeologist, I would love to excavate uh, in the Temple Mount area, yes. but there are religious sensitivities. Uh, it is the Muslim uh, uh, place of worship, the Haram al-Sharif in, in Arabic, the, 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 the splendid uh, enclosure, and that's where, according to tradition, uh, Muhammad alighted to, to the heavens. And so for, on that basis, there, there's no possibility of excavating within. However, you can do a lot of research based on even the examination of the external walls. Here on the left of uh, this gate, you can see the remains of large stones at the base of the wall, which can be dated all the way back to the, the Hasmonean period, to the late Hellenistic period, and perhaps even earlier. And on the far left, you can see a little gate there, which is uh, blocked up just behind the tombs over there. And what's interesting is that at the base of this uh, gate, that might be the Shushan Gate, which is referred to in the texts, through which the sunlight would have then uh, fallen ah. through the gate, straight through uh, in, the, in the direction of uh, the temple itself, the house of God. It would have, because of all the gold which was on the exterior of uh, the temple, it would have made this a most amazing monument. And so you can imagine when Jesus comes into the city, uh, um, on, you know, coming from the direction of Bethany, surrounded by his uh, followers, it must have been an amazing view to see this golden temple, the house of God, you know, beckoning him from a distance. What lies ahead for Jerusalem? This city, so precious to God, has been at the center of Bible history for more than 4,000 years. And its future? Zola Levitt reveals the answer in this week's resource, a booklet entitled, Jerusalem Forever. Zola writes about the history of this great city and its future for believers. Call 1-800-WONDERS 
or go to levitt.com. If you value what we do here at Zola Levitt Ministries, please remember to support our work as you're able. We have three ways you can do that. You can write us a check at Zola Levitt Ministries, Post Office Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. Or you can go to our website at levitt.com and click on the Donation tab. And you can always call us at 1-800-WONDERS. And as always, thank you very much. And you, as a scientist, you're majoring in what is, not speculation, theological prejudices, or uh, a, a mindset. You, you, you mentioned before that you, you're looking for objective evidence, and I believe you've found some, and you've, you've uh, really opened the door for other scientists as well. I have no problem in describing myself as a biblical archaeologist, but I'm looking at the science, and, and uh, the exact, we have to be very exact about how we interpret the, the evidence that comes out of, of the ground. Um, but here we can bring together uh, uh, biblical texts, uh, information that comes from uh, alternative sources, such as the, the writings of Josephus Flavius, who was a Jewish historian of the first century, and uh, put that together with our archaeology. And it allows us to recreate Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And it tells us uh, about the difficulties that Jesus had getting his message across in this very important city, because the streets were narrow, there were a lot of houses which are built up uh, one against the other. Um, the public spaces available to him were quite pagan and, you know, the Hippodrome and a the theater, it's not the sort of place he would go to. So the only place that he could really get his message across was either within the, the area of the temple itself, within the outer courts, or within the two pools uh, close to uh, the temple, the Bethesda and Siloam pools, where he could then also um, deal with aspects relating to healing, yes. which of course was so important uh, in terms of his mission. And that's what I was just thinking, that there were only two miracles in Jerusalem, one at Beth Chesed, uh, Bethesda pool, and the other at the pool of Siloam. Yes. Both stories are recounted in the Gospel of uh, John. Um, what's interesting, I've done research uh, on the uh, Bethesda Pool, which is just in this direction, just beyond the, the Temple Mount, and I found something really quite interesting, because in the Gospel of John, uh, in chapter 5, we hear about the murmuring on the water. Yes. Uh, when the invalid is taken in yes. and Jesus takes him in, uh, uh, there's, there, there's something really interesting. We found the steps and landings. Another flight of steps and landings. Landings, of course, so that the beds could be placed there for those who are, um, who are unable to walk down into the water themselves. And the murmuring of the water is because there you have uh, a reservoir, the so-called northern pool, and through uh, a, a, a little tunnel at the base of the wall there, water was brought into the southern pool. Whenever water came through, then you get the bubbling ah. up of, of uh, the, the air which is being expelled, and that is the murmuring on right. the water. Some translations say the stirring of the water. Exactly. Uh, but there's an, in, an interface between the supernatural and the natural, perhaps, exactly. at those places. From the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem, we take you to the north of Israel to hear from our man in Haifa, Eitan Shishkov. Shalom, I'm sitting right next to the Haifa Bay, and uh, really the Haifa Bay lies in the shadow of Mount Carmel, just to the south of us. Uh, now, most of you will remember the story of Elijah, the prophet who called down fire onto Mount Carmel. I just want to remind you uh, what it says in the scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, that Israel had forsaken the commandments of the Lord and had begun to follow uh, the, the Baals. Uh, Elijah said to Israel, send and gather all of Israel on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's temple. This was quite a, quite a major event during a time when Israel was far from God. And uh, it's really interesting because today, if we were able to see it, uh, the entire slope of Mount Carmel is covered with high rise apartments uh, there's a huge modern international harbor. And behind me, you can even see uh, an ocean freighter, which is bringing commercial goods from uh, the ports of the world into Israel through Haifa. Uh, this uh, tremendous influx 
uh, of population was not there in Elijah's time. In Elijah's time, we're talking about a mountain and we're talking about people having come uh, from uh, the neighboring area just up the coast is where Jezebel was from. Jezebel and Ahab, you will remember, were queen and king at that time. And the spiritual struggle was immense. Interestingly, now, uh, what, what should we say, uh, more than two and a half uh, millennia later, there is still a struggle on Mount Carmel and in this area because, of course, uh, the present-day residents of Israel are not all worshiping the God of Israel. Uh, many are, are worshiping material things. Other uh, are, are worshiping uh, actually Eastern, uh, Eastern gods and, and uh, all kinds of, of false idols. So this battle continues until today. And I want to bring you into this battle in the way of prayer. It was in the book of James uh, that we read the statement that the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. And Elijah is given as an example because it didn't rain for three and a half years. But as soon as Elijah appealed to God, called down fire from heaven, then they saw the cloud the size of a man's hand over these waters. And then the rain began to fall. The rain of the Holy Spirit will come on this land, but it's really depending on our prayers, yours and mine. Thank you so much. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com, you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra, or a cruise of the Greek Isles. Please contact us for more information. We are looking forward to the end of the age and the beginning of something fantastic, something wonderful. Behind me, over my left shoulder, you see the Golden Gate, the Messiah's Gate. We are looking for Yeshua to come down, touch the Mount of Olives, and then come through the Messiah's Gate as He said He would, as Zechariah said He would. And so, in a parallel way, the Jewish people are looking for Yemot HaMashiach, the day of Messiah. Isn't it amazing? These parallel yearnings of the Christian believers and the Jewish people looking for the day of Messiah. And his, He will reveal Himself, and we Jewish people look upon Him whom we have pierced and mourn as if for an only Son, and then welcome in a greater way Him. You know, that's why we as we bring people to the land, we always want to be connected to the body of Messiah here. We want to help them, we want to support them, pray for them, support them financially, because we believe in Galatians 6.10 that we're to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. And that's a mandate that's been on Catherine and myself for many, many years. You know, the day of Jacob's trouble will precede that. And we're looking towards the Acharit Hayamim, the end of days. There are some wonderful promises in Jeremiah 30 and 31 about the new covenant, about the new day, about in spite of Jacob's trouble, how God is going to bring his people to himself. And we're looking forward to Revelation 21, where the Lamb himself will be the light of the kingdom. We won't even need the sun and the moon, because the Lamb himself, Yeshua, will be the light of the kingdom. As we close this segment, I want to invite Catherine to come in and join me. And I want you to join with me as I call for the Jewish people to know our God in this central prayer of all Hebrew life. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Baruch Shem Kivod, Mahuto Leolam Vaed. Blessed is your holy name, which is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Shalom, Pray for the kingdom of God. 
Pray for the time of his coming. Pray for the temple of worship in Israel. And pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, there's a call going out to all of us today to hear. You know, the Shema is all about hear, O Israel, but it's about hearing for all of us to hear that the Lord our God is one and that there's a destiny for each of us to walk in. For the Jewish people, it is to make pilgrimage home. For the, for the Gentiles, it is to not only reap the harvest in these last days, but is to stand with his people and to be that watchman on the wall and to never give the Lord silence day or night until he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. Well, that is really well said. Uh, it's really a spiritual battle. You know, sometimes when we do programs like this, people can think, oh, well, they don't like Muslims or they're against the Arab people. Right. Let's completely Not untrue. Not our heart at all. No, what is true is that we're seeing a spiritual battle yeah. that goes all the way back to Genesis mm -hmm. 3.15 when there was the confrontation between God and Satan, mm -hmm. the serpent, in the right. garden. And the warning came to Satan that, uh, that God was going to raise up the seed of the woman, Messiah, right. to bruise his head mm -hmm. and that he would bruise his heel. In other words, at the cross, mm -hmm. Messiah's heel would be bruised. He would take a blow for all of humanity but he would crush Amen. the work of the devil. And that's what we're seeing play out. And so the way that works with Israel is that if the enemy can keep the Jewish people from coming home, right. keep the Jewish people from calling on him, right. then he can lengthen his time as ruler of this world. Right. But his time is short and he knows it. And so that's why there's more and more tumult in the area. Mm -hmm. But we really see that it is primarily a spiritual battle. Uh, we don't war against flesh and blood. And that's what's being played out right now in the land. You know? Yeah, it's so important that we remember that, you know, love is the victory of our believer and love is the victory of our, of our to love, to love people mm -hmm. and to walk in that love and to let that overflow in these days. Yeah, and part of that love is to be honest about what you believe. I have an Orthodox Jewish friend who, uh, and this may be surprising to you, an Orthodox Jewish friend who says to me, Miles, if you really believe that Jesus is Messiah, then if you love me, you'll tell me that. I won't agree that for now. I may not agree, but at least I know you love me because you're telling me the most important thing to you. And that's a very mature attitude, one that we don't hear very often. But the fact is that God is going to sort it all out because Zion is his place. And that is also why every time we end our program with this simple prayer, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Don't forget to order this week's resource by calling 1-800-WONDERS, or you can purchase it from our catalog at levitt.com. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries.